Welcome. Uh, my name is David Malone, and I'm privileged to work at the UN University. I have with me today the two editors of a book, uh, Poised for Partnership. It's a book that drew together quite a large number of authors, and I'm going to turn to them shortly uh, to tell us a bit about the project of putting this book together before we get into its subject matter, its substance. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce Anthony Yazaki. He's a Japanese-American who's been at UNU uh, for a few years now. He came first as a master's student and then stayed on with our in-house think tank, the Center for Policy Research, where he's been doing very valuable work. So welcome, Anthony. Thank you. And next to him, uh, Rohan Mukherjee, who comes to us from MIT in Boston. Uh, he's a scholar who's uh, just finished his uh, PhD. He's moving to uh, the exciting new uh, undergraduate college in Singapore, Yale and US, a partnership between Yale University and the National University of uh, Singapore. So Rohan, welcome also. Thank you. Now, Anthony, uh, or Rohan, uh, can you tell us a bit about how the book was put together? You two thought up the format of the book and how it might work. Sure. Uh, so what we did really was to look at the areas of cooperation that India and Japan had talked about uh, in their official statements over the last decade since sort of uh, Prime Minister uh, Yoshiro Mori's visit in 2000 um, and sort of tried to get uh, thematic areas that, that both countries were interested in cooperating. Uh, we, we identified four areas through that method and we've, uh, we, they were uh, security, economics, uh, energy and global governance. And then within each area, we decided that in order to have a high quality product that blended both the experience of people who have worked in the field for a long time uh, and have studied these issues for a long time and the fresh insights of younger people uh, who are coming up with more innovative methods and ideas to study these questions, uh, it would be interesting to pair people within these areas to write these chapters. And so within each of these focus areas, we had two chapters, one from the Indian side, one from the Japanese side, and each chapter was co-authored by one senior individual and one junior individual. And that really worked out very well in putting this volume together. And certainly both sets of authors seem to have enjoyed the experience of working with a different generation altogether. Um, now, uh, Anthony, the uh, subject matter of the chapters you put together, what did you decide the principal themes had been in the relationship uh, since Prime Minister Mori visited India. Right, well, we've broken the relationship down uh, into four broad categories, uh, starting with economics and uh, security, as well as uh, energy security, which is a topic we felt was often under-discussed. And then finally, we focused on global governance, so uh, in international institutions such as the UN. Great, uh, and so coming to some of these subjects first, uh, the reason for a serious relationship between Japan and India, uh, the two countries are actually quite far apart, although they uh, belong to the same continent. And there had been lots of talk over the years about how important the relationship was and nothing much happened. Why is it that uh, over the last 15 years, but perhaps particularly since uh, Prime Minister Abe returned for his second term as Prime Minister, uh, has uh, the relationship really taken off in terms of the leadership of the two governments paying a lot of attention to it? I think it largely has to do with sort of international structural factors such as the security threat that that Japan has been facing and it's been a deteriorating security environment in East Asia for Japan. If you look at North Korea's uh, nuclear tests and missile tests, if you look at China's sort of uh, maritime disputes at, in the Senkaku Islands with Japan and, and the, the uh, sort of uh, other fishing disputes that go on in the South and East China Seas. Uh, so Japan has sort of perceived a deteriorating security environment uh, while at the same time India has moved away from its traditional policy of non-alignment and sought to diversify its foreign policy portfolio. So there was an automatic 
uh, sort of meeting of interests in, in this domain. However, I think it was the arrival of Prime Minister Abe that added what, what he called him and uh, his foreign minister called uh, value-oriented diplomacy. And in, and in that, they meant that they were looking for other democracies with which to partner to create what they called an arc of freedom and prosperity in Asia. Mm -hmm. And some people say that this is you know, in order to contain China, but really it's much more about uh, bringing democracies together that have a natural uh, ability to understand each other's institutions and to cooperate on both economic and security issues. Mm -hmm. Talking about uh, democracies, uh, Anthony, uh, in a way the elephant in the room whenever international relations are being discussed amongst Asians uh, is the United States with Australia also playing a certain role. Uh, so is the relationship in part one that includes a silent partner in the United States or is it more complicated than that? Well, if you look back into the uh, history of Japan-India relations, you see that uh, Japan and India's relationship in many ways has mirrored the relationship between India and the US. Mm. So when you look back to the Cold War and India's policy of non-alignment, there was a great deal of distance between the U.S. and India, which was also reflected in the distance between Japan and India. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, as India and the U.S. have grown closer, we see that uh, Japan and India have uh, paralleled that as well. So, in a sense, there is certainly an American element to the relationship as well, but uh, I think part of the imperative at the moment is to uh, push Japan-India relations beyond that point where uh, they are able to stand on their own two legs. And there may be good reasons for that because the current uh, American election campaign has upended a number of assumptions, at least temporarily, and invites Asians to think about a future in which the U.S. might be less rather than more involved in Asian affairs. So Rohan, uh, is that possible future reflected in some of the thinking that went into the book or is it just too new? Uh, no, I think that's certainly, as Anthony mentioned, part of the reason why Japan has been seeking to also lo look at other partners in Asia. Um, it's, it's not so much a concern for India because India has not depended on the United States for its security in the way that Japan has traditionally. Uh, however, I think people are increasingly recognizing the need to create a strong bilateral partnership between India and Japan in the event that the U.S. may decide or may be unable to have a strong presence in East Asia or South Asia in the future. Mm -hmm. And so you see India sort of going out uh, developing its naval capabilities to patrol the Indian Ocean. Uh, you see the Japan Coast Guard and, and the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force also taking a great interest in maritime security. These are traditionally things that the United States would take care of. But I think there is a, an increasing emphasis on bilateral partnership for self-reliance. Mm. Great. Now, one of the topics you mentioned uh, is energy. And both countries face challenges in energy supply. Uh, Japan was doing very well until the Fukushima accident uh, caused the government to shut down all of the nuclear plants in the country and only one so far or a couple have been able to reopen since. Uh, and there's a sense with the recent earthquake in uh, Kyushu that really anything that relies on a great deal of structural integrity may simply not be that good an idea in Japan. So Japan uh, faces a future in which its nuclear bet may be less reliable than it thought it was, and at the same time it's a long way away from the oil supplies which uh, it has used to substitute for them. Likewise, India, while uh, the economy was largely underperforming, could bump along with limited energy supply, but with the economy having really taken off over the last uh, 25 years, uh, energy there is in short supply. So uh, two sets of authors looked at this, and can you tell us a bit about it? Right, and you mentioned the energy challenges that each country is facing, and something that further complicates that is also the global need to respond to climate change. So there's a need to uh, meet, uh, fill these energy gaps in both countries while doing so in a manner that is uh, not going to rapidly continue to grow carbon emissions. Mm. So uh, we, in the book, we've looked at uh, what are the complementarities of the uh, 
energy characteristics of both countries. And at the moment, uh, when you look at uh, India's rapidly growing demand for energy, a way that Japan can assist India is through uh, the provision of uh, high technology uh, energy resources. For example, uh, through the use of clean coal technology mm -hmm. in India, where uh, India currently uses almost 50% of its energy coming from coal. So should Japan be able to provide uh, clean coal technologies which are relatively uh, innovative and also uh, somewhat expensive, this would allow India to continue the use of this uh, abundant natural resource that it has while also uh, slowing the growth of emissions. And now you mentioned also the uh, geography of Asia in the sense that uh, much of Japan's energy uh, is coming from the Middle East and India is well placed to uh, help defend these uh, sea lines of communication where the uh, energy supplies are transiting through. So there are various ways in which these uh, complementarities, uh, there can be a, a so somewhat of a trade-off between the two mm -hmm. countries in meeting their own interests. And if, of course, India were to adopt uh, Japanese clean uh, coal technologies, uh, India is exploiting coal on such a large scale that that would actually in and of itself probably drive the cost of those technologies down rather than up. So there is a clear complementarity uh, there. Uh, Rohan, the book also takes up the wider business relationship uh, and economic relationship but because both countries are free market economies, it comes down very largely to the business communities in the two countries who do their own deals with each other, sometimes with a little bit of concessional support from uh, the Japanese aid program. So this has not developed particularly as far as I know. And uh, in the research there w that was done, were uh, any uh, strategies identified that look promising in order to make the two private sectors more comfortable with each other? Yes, uh, so we had very excellent chapters written by economists uh, in the book by Devesh Kapoor and mm -hmm. Rohit Lamba for India and for, by Shuji Rorata and Mitsuyo Ando for Japan. And they both looked at, first of all, the complementarities between the two economies, but also reasons why they were not cooperating. And, and among them are very simple issues like soft skills, cultural awareness, business practices, awareness of business practices in each country. Um, things that, the, as, as other people have pointed out, the Korean companies in India have already figured out. Mm. And I think a lot of it uh, has to do with the weaknesses of the Indian regulatory system, the unpredictability of it. Uh, so there's a lot of work that India has to do itself to improve its own business environment. But that is not particular to Japanese companies. All companies that operate in India, even Indian companies suffer from those, those problems due to the regulatory mm. environment. Uh, so I, the, the other side of the coin is Japanese businesses need to take a more, uh, I, I guess, uh, open attitude towards risk taking uh, and a more flexible approach to decision making so that they can actually take advantage of this relatively unpredictable but highly uh, potentially gainful uh, business environment. And that, that's something that has to be a, almost a cultural shift that has to take place. Because if you look at Japanese companies, they're very comfortable operating in Southeast Asia in countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and other places, uh, which really aren't very different in terms of their domestic setup uh, compared to India. Mm. So there seems to be a somewhat of a mental block. They, the companies identify India as a very desirable long-term partner, but they're waiting for India to get its act together. But really, if they wait for that, they might be waiting a very long time. And they could be shut out, too, yes. by others exactly. uh, who are more entrepreneurial. I think, Anthony, you live here in Tokyo, and I don't know if you'd agree with me that there is a widespread sense here that Japanese uh, business leadership, which used to be very risk-taking and entrepreneurial, has become extraordinarily conservative uh, in uh, the last decade, perhaps a bit more, the last two decades. So this could turn out to be a real barrier to the sort of risk-taking that Rohan was advocating. Right, I think that's absolutely true, but there are uh, some signs for optimism. For example, uh, in recent surveys, Japanese businesses have identified India as one of, as the top country for, uh, as a destination for investment in the medium to long term. So there is a certain recognition within the Japanese business community that uh, India is a promising uh, location for the future, but now how to turn that sentiment into action, how to turn that into the flow of capital 
is another question, and that is uh, sort of at the core of what we get at in the book is the mechanics of how to make that happen. And as Rohan was pointing out, those are factors that everybody faces, internal actors in India as well as external ones. It, it does require shifting to a different comfort zone and uh, taking more risks. Now, finally, the strategic relationship. We've talked of some reasons why the strategic relationship uh, needs to grow or can grow. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add, Rohan, to that? I think the one thing that would benefit both countries is, is defense uh, cooperation, particularly co-production or even arms sales uh, in terms of equipment. So India is quite interested in the maritime surveillance aircraft the US too that Japan uh, manufactures. And Japan in general has, has, has become a very sophisticated manufacturer it of is. defense equipment. Mm. And India is looking to diversify away from its de traditional dependence on Russia. Mm. So this is really another golden opportunity for the two countries to sort of work together. Uh, and also this creates a sort of technological familiarity mm. and interoperability between the two militaries, which is going to be essential going forward in Asia. Mm. Anthony, anything on that one? Uh, well, I think in terms of defense procurement that Rohan was just speaking about, I think uh, with Japan having been restricted from uh, engaging in arms sales for uh, since the end of the world, uh, Second World War II, or excuse me, the Second World War, uh, I think there is quite a bit of political symbolism that uh, one of its first arms sales it intends to make is going to be to India. So I think uh, that shows quite a bit of intent in, uh, in the Japanese leadership in terms of uh, how important it views uh, India to be as a strategic partner going forward. Absolutely, and building a bridge uh, between uh, military procurement and actual defense cooperation between the two countries, we've seen them engage in joint naval exercises, uh, it seems to me, with increasing frequency since about 2007. Um, if that extends to other areas also beyond na strictly naval ones, probably a higher comfort level will also start existing in terms of exchange of weaponry systems and so on. So it seems to me you've got the right title. The relationship is poised, but not quite there yet. So the next few years will tell the story and perhaps some years now you'll both come back to the relationship and tell us where you think it's uh, gotten to in the meanwhile. Thank you both very much for being here, for joining us this evening for a discussion with other uh, authors in the book and congratulations for pulling off such an ambitious project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you'll join us again online uh, for one of these conversations which generally focuses on one or other dimension of international relations as befits the UN's university. <laughs>